to jump in and my first question is for you, Robert. This was actually submitted by the audience. There's a lot of online talk about manipulation in the silver market. And some investors wonder if as a consequence, it's even worth playing this market. So what's your take on manipulation in the sector and how do you manage that? It is manipulated, but I'll go back in time. This here is a 1964 Kennedy half dollar. This coin changed my life. So in 1964, I was 17 years old and I had to I had caddy to make money. And uh, one day I was looking at this half dollar, it was no longer silver, it was copper. It's manipulated. So at that time, looking at this little copper coin here, and 64 was the last year that silver was still inside of our money. And so, they, so all of a sudden, I'm, I'm looking at this copper coin, and I didn't know it, Jay, but there's a law called Gresham's Law. And Gresham's Law states, when bad money enters the system, good money goes into hiding. I didn't know how much that would change my life because in 1964, I no longer trusted my government. And I took candy to get my little dollar bills. I got $1 for nine holes, $2 for 18 holes, four bags, you know, all this stuff. But I take those dollars, I knew it was fake at that point. And I would trade my dollars in for rolls of dimes, quarters, and half dollars. And I'd sit there, and anything with copper in, I threw it back in, and I gave it back to the bank. So I had this bag full of what they call dirty silver today, it's called. And you can buy dirty silver in these old coins. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. And so I, 1964, 1965, I go to school in New York. I have this big bag of silver coins. I come back to Hawaii, where I'm from, and I ask my mother, what happened to my bag of money? She says, I spent it. <gasps> no, so I made a judgment. You know, it's one of these traumatic. I've, I've been to a psychiatrist a lot of times because. Of it. <laughs> but this is, I, I made kind of a, a, a decision. I said, the reason poor people are poor is they don't know real money from fake money. Yes. And so our m money is completely manipulated. So that's why I'm here. That's why I speak for Jay. That's why I'm on gold and silver and numismatic. We've got to get back to real money. And for people stupid enough to not know real money from fake m money, they got what's coming to them. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Lynette, I actually want to go to you with the exact same question, if I could. I saw you nodding enthusiastically, and I know this is one that's also very teed up for what you do. So, same question, uh, manipulation in the silver market, what's your take and how do you manage that? Well, first of all, the way that I manage it, so I'll start that first, and that's about knowing the true value of an asset or any instrument. That, that's its fundamental value because ultimately that's where it's going. I'm not a short-term trader, so I really don't care about the spot market. And especially in silver, when you look at the supply and demand dynamics, it's ridiculous for a spot. I don't know where it happens to be at this moment, but like at $22, $23 an ounce. You can't buy it for $22, $23 an ounce, right? There's going to be a premium in there. So what I do is I accumulate. I accumulate because what I know is that we're at the end of the currency's life cycle, this whole big experiment, not just the US dollar, not just the Canadian dollar, but every fiat government debt-based money. We uh, The debt bubble has already been popped. That's the difference between last year and this year is that the debt bubble has already been popped. And ultimately, all assets go to their true fundamental value, which to, to Robert's point, that fake money, the fundamental value is a big fat zero. But for good money, for real money, that you hold it and you own it outright, 
that too will come to pass, and this will indeed go to its true fundamental value. And then there are so many opportunities in this wealth transfer cycle that we're in that if you're holding good money, you're going to be able to take advantage of it. Of course, the two of you walk around with silver coins in your pocket, both of you. Well, <laughs> jewelry too. Yeah, I love it. That's well, excellent. All right, all right, Peter, I want to come to you next because Lynette, you mentioned, you know, you're not a short term trader. You guys are going to get so sick of me talking about Time Horizon, but I just think it's so important. So, Peter, you wrote a book recently, became a bestseller in this industry, outlining the case for why you feel like silver is the best investment of the generation, more or less to summarize. So what would you have to say to investors who have been beating their head against the wall for a long time, sitting on silver or silver stocks with no price action? Well, thanks, Jay. What I would say is that one of the rarest commodities is patience, and um, yes. especially in silver. But um, as Rick Rule told me, silver was, has been uh, an outsized contributor to his net worth. I was chatting with uh, Willem Middlecope just yesterday, and he said he absolutely loves silver. It's, an, it's a fantastic asset to own, could be a fantastic asset to trade, but if, you don't, if you're not patient, you're not going to benefit from the upside that comes from silver. Jeff knows quite well in his presentations. He tells us how, and I've talked about this as well, how it goes through these long periods of doing absolutely nothing. And then it explodes. And if you think that you're going to jump right in right before it explodes, you're wrong. You need to be sitting there and you need to be waiting. Take your time. Do the research. I mean, uh, as we know, um, the silver equities have been challenged, n not different from, from gold equities. Um, but if you do your, your research um, and you accumulate these positions, you don't have to jump uh, head, headstrong into a full position, accumulate, and over time you'll be rewarded. Uh, it's proven itself time and time again. And, and you don't have to take huge risks. I'll, I'll give uh, an example. Wheat and precious metals in 2008, in November 2008 to, to April of 2011, was up 17 times. This is the largest silver company, public company out there. So again, you don't have to take outsized risks. You can invest across the board, or anything from, and I do recommend physical silver. You can go into silver ETFs and all the way down to the juniors, but depending on your comfort and your own risk profile, there certainly is something for everyone. Um, and I feel that you, you should take advantage of the volatility. So. Silver does, in my view, belong in everyone's portfolio. It's a, matter of, it's a matter of proportion, and you have to know yourself. You know, Wheaton, Precious Metals, as you just mentioned, they're set to generate a billion dollars in free cash flow this year. It's an amazing business. Um, okay, Glenn, I want to pass it to you, because I bet you have a different take on this, or, or maybe my conversations with you have led me to believe you're really good at just kind of emotionally detaching from the silver price. You don't care. Your job is to find metal, pull it out of the ground, and sell it, right? So how do you process the volatility, volatility in the sector and the cyclicality? Well, look, Patience, I think everyone here has said patience. People don't understand how long it takes. And, and you have to be willing to be there for a long time if you want to make a return. Example, we've built three large silver mines in Mexico in our careers already. We sold three to majors. It takes a long time. The current company I'm working with right now, Silver Tiger, seven years, $100 million to get to a feasibility study in June so we can build it and have it in production in 2026. That's what we think about. Anybody who invested with us back then has to wait all the way until we build it to get the big return. But there are three numbers that I think are really important. And I'm sure all these smart people writing books have these numbers. But as someone who, who's going to make that metal, they're all waving around here. Uh, someone has to make it. Um, that's how it works. Yes, I don't have a coin, but she just loaned me here's this one. Um, <laughs> 51, 44, and 38. That's what I think about, because I'm going to be in production in 26. Today, we have 51 true silver projects in the world. In 2027, there's going to be 44. In 2028, there's going to be 38. Every day, as a miner, we work to put ourselves out of business. That's just the reality of what we've done almost for 30 years. Um, 
it's really hard to get there. Um, I think the companies that give the biggest return, if you can be patient, are the ones that go from that first map to hundreds of thousands of meters to $100 million. That's our limit. That's what we put in this company to get to where we are, $100 million we've raised in the last seven years. And that's how you get to be 39. That's it. That's what we do. And someone has to make it. But look at that production and where it's going. Um, we'll talk a bit about AI, uh, all in sustaining costs, if you want to, maybe a little bit later, because that's very, very important. That's what I watch too. And watch what's happening to that now, what's gonna happen in the next several years. For miners, that's directly linked to the silver price. Okay, I'll, I'll definitely come back to you with that then. Uh, Jeff, over to you. I mean, what, what Glenn just outlined is essentially a consequence of this industry being starved of capital for 10, 12 years, no new projects coming online. He says, we're, we're working to put ourselves out of business. What he's referring to is they're exhausting the metal in the mine. Eventually it runs out, you gotta find new ones. Jeff, are you allocating capital in this sector in response to that? And if so, where are you looking for opportunity right now? I think that's a long-term trend. It's going to happen. It's going to take years to really play out, but the supply-demand issue is real. It's a little bit bigger picture, longer term than what's happening in uranium right now. Copper's in a similar position. Uh, so yes, there have been fewer discoveries. There have been fewer mega discoveries. Uh, there are fewer mines coming to production over the coming years. All those things are gonna play into the supply demand picture for silver. Um, what's ultimately gonna drive the silver price higher is uh, if you, you know, throw out the fundamentals for a minute, throw out all the, the technicals, uh, the manipulation argument, put that all aside for a second, it's all true. But if you look at just the price behavior, and some of you maybe have heard me talk about this. If you look at just at silver's DNA, its price history and its behavior, it has long periods where it's boring and does nothing. Long periods where it should be rising, right? It should be rising now for monetary issues and concerns, but it's not. So it's boring, and then it's boring, and then what happens? All of a sudden, boom, the price goes. So it's boring, boring, boom, repeatedly. There's been a dozen of these cycles over the years. I've documented these, and I think we're in a boring phase now, obviously, and at some point, this thing is gonna ignite, and as like Peter said, you're gonna have to be long before then, because if you wait, it'll be too late, because the price will be taking off very quickly, and of course, premiums will be rising on top of bullion prices, and the equities will be uh, rocketing higher as well. So you have to remain long, you have to be patient. It's going to happen. It is going to happen for silver because history says so. History says so. And so that's, what I, that's how I'm investing. Robert, did you just pull out a prop? <laughs> <laughs> What's this going on over here? It's a prop. This used to be a silver certificate. Now it's fake money. And the question is, would you rather have that or this? And that answers the, an the question, is it manipulated? This thing is more easily manipulated. That thing is almost impossible. So I'd rather save silver than this, plus silver is still 60% off its all-time highs. It's the biggest bargain in the markets today. I remember it was about fifty dollars or something, and today it's like about thirty. And this is manipulated. <laughs> so that's what I have to say. You know, this is this is what people are saving and working for. That makes more sense. That's what I say. Now, Robert, do you have any rules in your in your your personal wealth? in terms of ratios between, no, no rules at all probably, between ratios between gold and silver, physical? I subscribe to Miss Piggy's rule of money management. <laughs> Always manage to have more money, you know what I mean? <laughs> and and what, they're, what they're doing is they're printing and taxing us. And we let them do it to us. So that's why it's really, really, it's a tragedy. The other thing, too, is I have, in America, we have green boxes and green boxes of silver. The reason I keep that because I'm a pessimist. 
if the S hits the fan, I know that I can spend those silver dollars, but I don't know if they'll take this. So I have stacks and stacks of green boxes just in case. <laughs> Can I also yeah, say that, please? Okay, and the other part of that is this, if you would hold that up, please, Robert. Okay, this is used in one area, the financial system. Toilet this, paper. Exactly. This is used in every single sector of the global economy. So this has, which has more functionality? This or this? Therefore, what has more demand? So to Robert's point, toilet paper. Right? But this has use in every single sector of the global economy. So they're manipulating this. It's hard to manipulate that. It's almost impossible to get. Plus, uh, Andy Sheckman always says, every Tomahawk missile flying into wherever they're flying them into has 14 pounds of silver in it. We're blowing it up. <laughs> All right, now a question for, for Jeff and Peter. You know, silver is that metal that can play two roles, right? Gold is a monetary metal, copper is an industrial metal, silver plays on both teams. Do either of those strike you um, as more bullish right now? And, and which do you, would you expect to be the driver of price performance over the next 10 years? There's a lot of promises being made on the heels of renewable energy, which is the industrial use case, and just you know, growth really in general, economic growth requires massive amounts of silver. You know, but as Lynette pointed out, we're, we're popping the debt bubble, which is the monetary use case. Do either one of those strike you with more bullishness than the other? And maybe Jeff, I'll go to you, and then Peter, I'll come back to you. Well, industrial use is clearly growing. I think everyone in the room knows that. Um, and that's going to continue, and that's partly due to political promises and industrial demand. If you look at the percent of silver that's going to industrial use, it's rising steadily every year. Uh, and that's with supply going up. So a greater percentage of a bigger pot of supply of silver is going to industrial uses every year. But that's a long-term trend. That demand picture is going to be there. It doesn't typically drive the price, at least historically. Um, that's going to continue to grow. What's really going to ignite the price is going to be some type of monetary event, uh, some type of fear like we had with COVID. And the COVID bounce, remember we all had the COVID crash, then we had the COVID bounce. In the bounce, uh, gold rose 40%, silver rose 140%. So are those that are saying, well, you know, silver is really an industrial metal now. Its use is growing, that's true, but that's like a giant ship, a giant barge in a port trying to negotiate a three-point turnaround. That's going to take a long time. That takes time to do that. Whereas the silver price in the meantime responding to monetary concerns or some other issue like that is like a speedboat whipping around the waves around that barge. So it's still going to happen, in my opinion. I still think it's, it's has monetary use and, it, and investors flee to it during monetary crisis times. That's still going to happen. I expect that to happen again. And the next one, you know, who knows? That, that could be uh, the mother of all bull markets. We'll see. So. Okay, Peter, I want to come to you with the same question. By the way, if anybody in the audience has questions, tweet them at me and I'll see them. It's at jmartinbc. Submit your questions. I'll see them on my screen. If anybody has any, you can submit them that way. Uh, Peter, same question for you, though. Yeah, so, you know, Jeff touched on a lot of the points that, uh, that I would bring forward as well. The industrial demand is rising. It was, a few years ago, it was 50%. Now it's about 60% already of, of, uh, of demand. Solar is a huge part of that. Last year, solar was 20% of all silver being used. Now, solar is really the 800 pound gorilla, you have to pay attention to what's happening with solar because even if solar production of uh, solar panels did not grow or flat for the next several years, the technology is changing. And already um, this year, new manufacturing capacity for the newer technology, one called Topcon, takes 50% more silver per panel. So again, if solar panel production did not grow, and it is, you, you're still going to need more silver for the solar industry. And remember, 
virtually none of the uh, of, of the solar uh, the silver that goes to solar panels gets gets recycled. So far, we haven't found a way to do that. So a lot of that's consumed. We're not going to ever see it again. A lot of the industrial um, uses uh, simply disappear. Um, I, I wish I could take credit for it, but uh, there's a guy by the name Eric Strand who runs a couple of funds out of Sweden, uh, AUAG funds, and he, he boiled it down to uh, uh, two, two basic themes. He said silver has two mega trends that are underpinning it. One is currency debasement, uh, so that's this whole inflation and uh, money printing, so silver is going to do well because of that. And silver has the green transition as the other mega trend. And, and I, and I want to say one other thing that uh, just before uh, my workshop earlier, I got um, some interesting, I got an interesting email from someone in the industry. So there's an, uh, a serious effort now by uh, silver mining companies. You have a, uh, a working group that has been put together. They are actually drafting a letter that's going to go to Re uh, Natural Resources Canada um, to make the case for silver to be considered a critical metal. Uh, they've already submitted their research. They're trying to get uh, a number of silver CEOs to sign this letter. And um, if any uh, silver CEOs want to want to sign that letter, reach out to me, and I'll I'll uh, do what I can to put you in touch with them. But uh, silver is a critical metal, and uh, it's becoming more so. Uh, and that's going to absolutely underpin it. Now, I, I believe the, the way I see it, much like, like Jeff, is that the industrial demand is what is going to help provide a rising floor under the silver price, but a steady rising floor. And then it's the investment demand that when it kicks in is what causes these huge rallies and spikes. And that's why you want to be in silver. Um, yes, it's been lagging. Have patience. It will absolutely pay off. It's done it multiple times in the past. And um, you've got to be in the game to benefit. I want to drill into your capital allocation now and get to that part of the business. Glenn, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, you, made a, you made a case for why all-in sustaining cost is a key metric to be looked at by investors. I want you to expand on that point for us. Absolutely. Uh, one thing I want to say first, though, is um, I, I came on this panel last year, and after I left, I felt so great because you guys all told me how high the price of silver was going to go. <laughs> and you've all been back room telling me that again. Um, so I'm so happy for about a week after I go back to Halifax after being with these people. But that doesn't matter. Yeah. Glenn, that means you but need to... That come back every year. <laughs> oh, well, no, okay, he'll be happy. Listen, the price is incredible. Our first mine, we produced gold at $265 and we made a lot of money. I'm going to do my first pour in 2026. I'd sign in blood right now on this table that I was going to produce that $2,000 gold and $23 or $24 silver. We dream of that. So the price... If it goes up the way they're talking about, oh boy, I'm gonna make so much money, it'll be so exciting. But it's fine right now for making the metal. Look at the producers that are making metal, especially the mid guys, they're doing fantastic. Um, being on that list of 39 in a couple of years is gonna be really important. But let's talk about all in sustaining costs. That's something I think about. Silver Tiger. We put our economic reports out about how much it's going to cost us to make the metal. I better know how much it's going to cost me to make the metal so I know how much profit I'm going to make. Our all in sustaining cost in our economic study, which will be further confirmed in feasibility in June this year, is $11. This year, all in sustaining costs in those 51 projects that I talked about has gone up 57% to $16.20. It's projected every year going forward for the next decade to go up by 9%. So that means next year it's 18, and then the next year it's 20, and so on and so on. What do you think that's going to do to the silver price? We have to make it. <laughs> we can't make it unless we make money. So I think that is something that people don't pay enough attention to, and you should watch those stats over the next year or so. If they keep going up by 60 70% a year, Oh boy, is, uh, is that going to be fuel on the fire for the silver price? That's what I watch. All right, I appreciate that, Glenn. Now, Jeff, over to you. Are you allocating cash into the sector right now? Where are you seeing value? Where are you putting your money? Well, I've been accumulating silver for a long time, and my dad was a big silver bull. Even though he was a gold prospector, he 
bought a lot of silver and collected a lot of silver. So I don't feel that I'm happy with the allocation that I have, but I do buy occasionally if there's a, a big sell-off. Um, where I'm allocating capital is to silver companies that uh, can make a big difference regardless of the silver price, uh, this being one example. So uh, I'm looking at companies that are going to make a discovery or have a significant advancement of deposit or about to go into pre-production, all these things being re-rating factors for a stock. So that's how I look at it, regardless of what may be happening with the metal. And someday all boats are gonna rise when silver does too. But in the meantime, I think we can be a little picky and, and, and select those that are gonna have uh, the most potential regardless of the silver price. All right, so we've got a few questions here from the audience and may, one- May I add one thing? Yeah, okay. please Robert, what do you got? Yeah. I don't save dollars, I save gold and silver because they're liquid. If I need dollars, I come right out of silver or gold. I have a friend who's now in his 90s, and I said, look, I need, I need $2 million. I'm a little, not short, but I'm, invest I'm starting something else. I need $2 million. And so I asked, I'm coming out the other way. I said, what should I sell, my silver or my gold? And he said, don't be an idiot, sell your gold. Hang on to the silver. So his, this guy's in his 90s, and he says, he, he, he verifies everything we're saying. Silver is the best thing on the markets today. All right. Glenn, Glenn likes that. I am very pleased to hear that, <laughs> Robert. Wow. All right, all right, all right. So we have a few questions from the audience. Um, one question has been asked four or five times. I'm not shocked. People want a price prediction. Uh, two dates have been called out. I'll go dump down the line. You can abstain if you want to, no worries. Price predictions for silver for Christmas 2024 and 2030. You can pick one or the other or both. Well, I have a question. Are we talking about the spot market or the physical market? Let's go physical. Okay. Oh, you want me to start? Take, take it away, take it away. I mean, that's okay. your world, that's your world. Um, I'm gonna say, Christmas 2024, 45 bucks. Oh boy. That's Christmas 2024, 45 bucks. Okay. And if I were to ask Spot Lynette, would you have a similar answer or would it be vastly no, different? No, I would not have a similar answer. Well, Maybe 22. Maybe 22. <laughs> okay, Peter, can you? I just, I just want to jump in quickly. This might help. Lynette, what's, what's um, physical right now for, for, for a, uh, a coin? A uh, one ounce coin. I'm pretty sure this is somewhere like 30, 33 bucks. US. US. Right. So do the conversion, right? Or, or not. Leave it in US. And if we're, talking about, uh, if we're talking about physical by Christmas, that's not that far off. No, it isn't. Exactly. All right. All right. Uh, we'll go down the line. Peter, I'll start with you. And you know what? It, it's a retail investor audience. Spot price might make more sense. I know you deal in physical, so you know, I, I like that it's suggestion. Spot is garbage. It's a lie. <laughs> it's just a lie. But yeah, okay. I, I won't argue that, but it's, we, can, we could verify the spot price a bit easier. Um, so Peter, I'll, I'll go to you. Christmas 2024 or 2030 or both price prediction. Okay, so I would say Christmas 2024 It'll have at least touched thirty dollars by then. That's that's my feeling, uh, given what I expect to happen macroeconomically during the year this year, and by 2030, uh, I think we could we'll, we'll have lived through some kind of a uh, of a mania, and if it's not 2030, it's sometime before, maybe a little bit after, but I think we could actually see silver go to three hundred dollars. Three hundred dollar, 2030 silver. All right. Um, Robert, would you like to make a price prediction? Not, not really. I, I like prices low, so I can buy some more of it. That's all I think about. <laughs> I like that. All right. Uh, Glenn, over to you. Do you want to? Well, 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 I'm going to tell you one thing. All this physical spot, when I get in production, I'm going to start making coins with tigers on them. You think that'll go well? I think totally, that'll be good. and I'll sell them too. <laughs> <laughs> um, do I think, I, I don't like making predictions. I told you all I love the price today. It's, it's beautiful for what we are going to do, and we're going to make so much money with such a beautiful deposit that we have. But we talk uh, 
our group that we think that in the short term we could see $30. So, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be there, but I, I think that's very realistic. I'm not even going to venture a guess where those guys are talking about way in the future, but uh, that's my thoughts on it. All right, thank you, Glenn. Jeff, final word, over to you. Okay, so silver, as we talk right here, right now, spot price, spot price limit, is 2205 So what I think is going to happen is silver's going to do nothing for a while, for the next six months, whatever. But six months after gold breaks out into new all-time highs, and I don't mean keeps teasing us, but it makes a sustained breakthrough 21, 22, 23, start the clock, six months later, silver's going to uh, spike and it's going to go to at least $30. So does that happen by Christmas? We'll see. Uh, 2030, you know, I hate saying this, but if you believe in $10,000 gold and you believe a gold-silver ratio of 20, uh, uh, that's $500 silver. I don't think that's necessarily far-fetched but I don't think I'm necessarily predicting that either. But one thing real quick I'll point out, um, the gold silver ratio has been 90 or above only uh, something like 210 days in all the, over the past 25 years. Most of that has occurred since 2019. So that shows you just how lopsided this whole thing is with silver. So if it's this lopsided on this side now, why can't it be lopsided to the other direction? And it's hard to believe that now because we all have recency bias, right? But I think that's the kind of thing that we're looking at. So triple digits triple over is, uh, for me, I hate saying this, but for me, it's probably a foregone conclusion. So Silver's you can all make- see why being on this panel makes me so happy. <laughs> I just wanted to say, if, if, if you missed the uranium bull, I'm not, I'm sure there's lots left, but silver could be the next uranium, or will be at some point the next uranium. All right, I'll take that. Okay, look, how did we do? Did you guys enjoy this?